Thank, thank you to all the uh, speakers. We have some time now for any comments or questions uh, from members of the audience. We have only one microphone, so people will have to shuttle uh, back and forth. So, thoughts? I can see that glare there is a little difficult. Yes, David. Me about Eric's slide, the average cost of monograph, uh, transline right to MLA and elsewhere, uh, and the audible gas was across the nation. Uh, so, uh, but the question that isn't me was what accounts for where, where does the majority of that cost come from? Because so what they like. If anyone's really interested in this, I would absolutely encourage you just to read Ithaca, I with the K. This is an open access report. Anyone can download it, and it goes into this in really great detail. I have, for the purposes of this discussion, elided some of the more interesting nuances and details, but you can see a pretty full and careful accounting of, what, of how they arrived at those numbers and what they mean in different cases. Um, I, yeah, it's, um, it's actually in my, oops, backwards. It's the cost of mono publishing monographs towards a transparent methodology. Um, for those of you who get really excited about this sort of thing, uh, it's a great read. Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, it might be a suitable uh, substitute for Xanax. Yes. Yeah. Well, again, not every book falls at the $50,000 range. That's the median. What I, what I was trying to allude to earlier, but this is uh, really true, is some of these costs are different presses allocate costs in different ways. And you have what you call press level overheads, which many presses don't even look at when they do their title level finances. But it doesn't mean that those costs aren't actually associated with those books. At California, because we're part of a public university and therefore we have some pretty weird costs added on, we're very, very careful about using those costs in every kind of calculation around a book. So things like general and accounting, you know, the fact that you have people telling you that you're making enough money or not making enough money, you have to pay them as well. So that's part of this that doesn't get kind of added in when you look at the Luminos book, when you think about um, office space. Or oh, and then other things as well, like certain kinds of marketing spend would not get included in the 15000 that we're talking about. It doesn't mean that they don't get used, but it just doesn't mean that it's allocated to that title. So some of this is really about how numbers are accounted. When I give that $50,000 number, that means basically every cost that a press occurred in that year is, is kind of glued into those books. So it's, it's, part of it's about how you think about what a book costs, right? Like you can think about it just in terms of the physical stuff. You can think about it just in terms of the people who work on it most directly, like me and my marketing partner and the project editor. Or you can think about it in terms of like the 30 people who work on it in various different ways and how their, um, uh, their resources and time and efforts are, are, are quantified. Does that make sense? Um, it's not a satisfactory answer, and it's something that I still grapple with. How much does it cost in each instance? Um, but, you know, one of the things you can see is just presses are struggling. That's why they keep getting closed and reopened and then closed and then moved and then changed. This is a really strong problem, and, uh, you know, part of it is because it is so tricky, because it is so malleable, and there's so many different ways to think about it and talk about it. Um, it really impedes progress, and I think one of the great things about the Ithaca report is it really kind of owns up to where there's some um, unclarity. I don't know if that's a word, but in these in these questions. <laughs>
I may not have quite caught the the ex exact question. Um, over time, how we how we are thinking about the exact numbers, or just the general idea of what's going to happen far out into the far out into the future. So, so I, I would, I would um, I, definitely 50, you know, <laughs> definitely 100, definitely 200, 5,000 years, I, I, I leave that to people then. We've lost most of what's been written probably in 5,000 years, you know, we're, we were continuing to lose things in the 8th century, 9th century, stuff that we don't have. So, so th th that, that's, um, but, but I believe that I saw's digital publication efforts will be available for this era of human history is how I would put it and I do that because I believe that because um, one they're in exceedingly readable so long as you know so long as Unicode can be read that's read and and Unicode is publicly identified if somebody two if somebody 500 years from now cares enough and they find this file and it hasn't been rolled over from Unicode into somebody else, something else. If they care enough, they'll put the work in to find it, just as, you know, the, the very annoying thing that is often said. It's a lot easier than reading Greek, you know, and there are a lot of people in this room who put in the time to learn how to, how to read that. So if somebody cares enough, my work is accessible. Um, uh, Yes. So, and and you know the NYU NYU partnership has, they have put it in not just their digital repository but their preservation repository. So it goes off and it's put in a mountain underneath somewhere. And then also it's on GitHub. I put it around the place. Hopefully other people have have have, have downloaded it. So some combination of our efforts and people making copies and really play, all but. You know, you can open our stuff in a text editor and just read it. It looks a little bit nicer in a web page, but not that much. You can just you just read read the characters should you want to. So so I don't know, and none of us will be here, but I'm trying. <laughs> to me or to yeah yeah yeah. So so I agree that it's possible, right, to, to reconstruct this stuff like chat about your communication. But I'm wondering who's going to think about five thousand years if not ancient historians or classicists and. Because some things from 5,000 years ago have been preserved sort of by your actions. So that that five thousand year question, yeah, I mean, we're it's, that's a great number. We're approximately at the five thousand year boundary of writing coming into existence, plus minus, if all well, you know, whatever. Um, uh, so so. I'll just, I'll just say, you know, all we can do is use the current technology and 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 try, and we have a lot of a lot to suggest that information will roll over. You know, what is the oldest library catalog? And this is something that I ask, this is something that I ask, and nobody's quite given me a good answer. But I think it's probably 50 or 60 years old. Like you can go into online library catalogs and search for a record and see not not the information itself because it's all been copied, but but the the implications of human action digitizing stuff. We're pretty good at rolling that over. So we have systems in place to make that happen. That's why. I saw partners with a library, a community that has, has the most experience in the longest term, longest lived digital data. I'm, I'm, I'm truly not answering your 5,000 year question because I don't have a new answer. I just, you know, if, if there is something to do, I'll, I'll say two things. If there's something to do, please let us know what it is. Or of course, do it yourself. Nobody's gonna sue you. Take our data and, and do it. If there's something else to do, Everybody can go and do it. So that that's 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 the ISO answer. I, I give to other people as well, of course. I'm just curious on the question of how much encompasses the publishing and academic on the because I get asked on a regular basis by my grandfather, why is WordPress only twenty-five feet? So I try to work out it's quite elderly, so it doesn't remember to really ask me to support. But am I right to think um, in terms of like, like something you use talking about the ancient economy, that many academic books are piggyback traits. In other words, the reason why you employ the people in the accounts department and all the other things that it takes to run a press is not really because of, let's say, books by me, but um, nevertheless, you may be working publishing books by me once you've got that infrastructure. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, 
I think for me, I get uncomfortable talking about money because it makes it sound like it's what determines what we acquire. Um, I don't make a lot of money. Most of my colleagues don't make a lot of money. Uh, nobody in this room makes a lot of money, let's be frank. You know, um, we do this because we care about it in different ways. Um, so I, that, I'm just kind of like acknowledging my feelings there before I answer your question, I guess. Um, but one of the ways that I, as an editor, think about my list, which is the books that I acquire, it is not just in terms of the mission, which is to disseminate scholarship, but the different ways that that can be accomplished. One of those ways is by publishing monographs. That is essential. You can't do it without this. Um, but that's not the only way that you can talk about scholarly um, uh, achievements and scholarly in, uh, insights. Some of that is translational. That's where you talk about traits, not a great word, but some books are written for broader audiences that's either synthesizing a larger body of research or taking something that might be kind of a unique viewpoint but still kind of putting it in the context of things for people who don't already have the kind of specialist knowledge. And then beyond that, there's taking the insights of scholarship and finding ways to use that for pedagogically driven books. That's something that's really important to me. Um, part of my list, a lot of my list recently has been with translations. It's not for some books, you know, there's plenty of Iliads out there, but you know, there's like one Pausanias from 50 years ago and it sucks. So getting a new one has been really important for me and that's gonna be out in like a year or two. Um, things like that, you know, I mean, and so I bring those up because those in the end, because they sell year on year, because they have a wider swath and because as we all know for ancient history, what better textbook than the texts? Unless of course you're archeologist, then you might want some other stuff as well. But the point stands, the materials themselves in fact get used over and over again. So if you can get scholars who are in a position to create that content or to um, you know, create kind of an apparatus around that, that makes it even more useful for people in the classroom, that doesn't just, um, that brings in revenue over year over year that can help kind of support the program, but it also drives the mission because you get more people excited about Pausanias for instance. You know, so there's a lot of ways in which these things kind of overlap and come back to one another. So I don't want to say it's like, oh, well, the trade books support the, you know, or the, 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 the textbooky kind of stuff supports that. Um, I think they're all part of the mission and they have, you know, maybe a good metaphor is kind of a portfolio, like you have some bonds, you know, the things that are just the most essential and they just have this. And then you have some really high risk stocks and sometimes those pay off and sometimes they're disastrous. And you have the things that kind of give you a good yield over a long time, but when you have all of them together, you have something of a, a stable portfolio. Maybe I shouldn't use that metaphor right now. <laughs> Who knows what the future holds on that end, but um, nonetheless, I think that's kind of how I think about it and how I think about the money aspect. I don't know if that answers your question or if that went too far abroad, but does it get somewhat to what you were? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk more, absolutely. Okay, let's thank our speakers and thank you all for coming.